Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual event, And Still I Vote, a Voter Suppression and Advocacy Training. I am Lindsay Langholz, Director of Policy and Program at ACS. As many as you know, ACS is a diverse, nation, diverse nationwide network of lawyers, law students, judges, scholars, and many others who are committed to upholding the US Constitution in the 21st century by working to ensure that law is a force for improving people's lives. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. First, please note that today's call is being recorded and the recording will be available on our website, acslaw.org. So please, if you find today's session to be a valuable resource, and we believe you will, um, do share the recording with others in your network who are interested in this critical issue. Second, if you would like to ask a question at any time, please use the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. We'll be taking questions after the presentation and we'll try to get to as many as possible, but pop them down there in the Q&A box and we will, we will get through as many as we can. And finally, ACS is a 501c3 organization. As such, today's event will be focused on nonpartisan efforts to battle voter suppression and ways that you can help. The right to vote to make one's voice heard and participate in our democracy is considered to be by many the bedrock of our system. This year, we celebrated two anniversaries, the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which states that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of sex, and the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment, which states that the right of citizens of the United States shall not be denied or abridged on account of race. And yet, the right to vote so fundamental to our American government has been denied or abridged to so many of our citizens for far too long. We are in the middle of an election season unlike any other, and I know many of you have joined to learn more about the history of voter suppression and ways that you can join the fight for voting rights. So today, we are lucky to have a team um, from the Leadership Conference with us to lead our training. Without further ado, let me turn it over to Jordan Fitzgerald to take it away. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, we're happy to be here. Um, Welcome to the And Still I Vote Voter Suppression Advocacy Training. I'm Jordan Fitzgerald, the Voting Rights Organizer at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. And Still I Vote is a national call to action for people to take back the power of the vote. It is, the campaign, it is a campaign of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, and it's powered in part by our sister campaign, All Voting is Local. We are excited you are joining us today to talk about voter suppression and advocacy to protect the right to vote in 2020. As Lindsay said, this is a year like any other, election year like any other. So thank you to the American Constitution Society for partnering with us on this important topic. So who is the Leadership Conference? We are a nearly 70 year old organization that focuses on the communities most impacted by barriers to the vote, communities of color. Together we work to eliminate needless and discriminatory barriers to voting before they happen to build a democracy that works for all of us. With our coalition and state partners, we inform the public, decision makers, and the media about barriers to voting and advocate for policies that expand the right to vote, especially in communities of color. Right now, everyone is talking about voting, but it's really important to understand why and how we found ourselves as a country in this moment. Before we get to all that, we wanted to show you a video that we hope you will find powerful and will help set the tone for the, our time together tonight. Elias, take it away. Voters in Randolph County, Georgia are outraged. Malone made a proposal to the Board of Elections to shut down seven of nine polling places in the predominantly black areas. As soon as polling places opened early this morning, the headaches began. This is so wrong. This is just so wrong. Now people are literally putting their lives at risk to cast a ballot. They purge 500,000 voters. Are you removing black voters from the voter roll just so to win this election? We are witnessing a tidal wave of voter suppression efforts around the country. This is what we call voter suppression. It is not letting me vote for who I want to vote for.
continuing victory in Florida. Convicted felons across the state now have their voting rights restored. And I promise you tonight we're going to make sure that every vote is counted. Every single vote. Powerful, and we hope that sets the stage um, for our time together tonight. In the midst of assaults on right to vote, it's critical that we fight for greater access to voting. 2020 is the election of our lifetime. We, I mean, people have said it in the past, but this time it's really true. And we cannot be silenced. So, in every corner of our country, policymakers have put up discriminatory barriers to the ballot that shut us out from closing polling places in black and brown communities to wrongfully erasing voters from the rolls, including low-income voters, seniors, and college students. They are taking away our right to vote and rigging the system for their own benefit. So that's why we developed this training, right? We not only wanted to talk to you about like what is voter suppression historically look like, but how it's playing out right now, every day. We are seeing it across the country during our primaries and we're hearing about it. Um, in the news almost every single day. So a key point we want to get across today that is vital that we are lifting, lifting up the history of voter suppression for all. Remind everyone that this isn't new. This is a new problem. It's important people remember that we have won before and we can win again. To build upon our collective skills and ideas, what we learn and discuss here should go out into the world. We are going to provide this training slide deck as well as a toolkit at the end of the training that we want you to use. We want you to take this out and really share it with other people and motivate people to, to, to get out to do something about voter suppression. We all bring our unique experiences and strengths to this work and that means everyone's perspective has value. Whether you're a first time voter or someone who has signed up to be a poll worker for the last 50 years, your voice is valued and needed. We want to be sure we all move to strengthen and grow a community of advocates to connect on this important work and to serve as a resource. That's why we developed the training and we've given it to almost a thousand people in just the last month. So specifically, our goals for the training are to understand the history of voter suppression, what it looks like today and create a sense of urgency around voting in a time of COVID and a heightened racial injustice to gain an understanding around mechanisms to further voting rights. We can do something about this. And to fight for voting rights with advocacy tactics to ensure greater access to voting in this time of COVID, which is just unprecedented. The COVID pandemic and the fight for racial justice have exposed the cracks in the system to many who had not been directly impacted before and with the voices of those who have lived this reality every day by amplify, is being amplified in our streets. These deepening cracks and vital systems cannot be ignored. It's something that we've ignored for just too long, but it, it, this year, now more than ever, we see just exactly what's happening. So at our nation's founding, voting was enshrined only for educated white men who own property. It took more than a century for that franchise to meaningfully expand to people of color, women, people with disabilities, people who are low income, and Native Americans. Today, some elected leaders are still working to silence people who are, were historically denied access to the ballot box. Voting and the ability to participate in democracy is a racial justice issue. It is a civil rights issue, and we are overdue for change. So let me tell you why I come to this work. Um, as a young girl growing up in Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, the daughter of a single mom who was a nurse and always worked the night shift, but found it so incredibly important to go vote and always instilled in me just what a privilege it was to exercise our right in democracy. So she would come home from her night shift or first thing in the morning, get me out of bed in my pajamas and take me to the polling location near uh, that was at her school near our house. And she, after she made her selections in the old school voting booths, uh, once that, uh, that uh, curtain was pulled, she would let me pull the lever. And I found that just so exhilarating and exciting and um, I uh, just became a lifelong voter in every election. 
and I went on to become a poll worker. So, um, and I saw the impact that that had on everyday people having access to the vote. So that's why I do this work, um, because we are long overdue for change and too many people are being silenced. Now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Navesha Noble, who's gonna talk a little bit more about our state advocacy worker work. Navesha? Thank you, Jordan. So my name is Navesha Noble and I'm a regional field manager here at the Leadership Conference Education Fund. As Jordan just mentioned, voter suppression is not a new issue. It is an issue that has been going on for years. When I was younger, I would go visit my grandparents and my great grandparents in the rural South and they would share so many stories about how hard it was for them to vote or how they didn't even have the opportunity to vote. At a young age, I didn't always fully understand what they were sharing, but one thing that stuck with me was how important they said voting is and how I should make sure that I am registered to vote at 18 and that I should participate in every election because there are so many people who fought hard for us to be granted this opportunity. Now that I'm older and I'm able to vote, I am seeing that some of the barriers that my grandparents and my great grandparents were telling me about are still quite relevant today. So I come to this work to help fight against the barriers that that are preventing people from voting because voting is a right that everyone should have access to, as Jordan has mentioned in the introduction. And that's what we're doing with All Voting is Local campaign, which, which we work in partnership with organizations out in the states like yours. Our ABLE team is on the ground in eight states where our mission is to expose and prevent discriminatory barriers to the ballot before election day. Fallout from the most recent primaries make it abundantly clear that we must act now to ensure every citizen can freely and fairly vote in the upcoming general election. And chaos at polling places in recent primaries have demonstrated that election officials have not done enough to date to hold safe and accessible elections during this pandemic. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, voters stood in line for hours at one of only five polling places down from 180. Voters had to find someone to serve as a witness to validate their ballot, even though there was a stay at home order because of the pandemic. The GOP brought 11th hour legal challenges that undid changes like deadline extensions that are just common sense for a pandemic. And these are just, these are just crazy things that are happening and we have to address this, which is why this training is so important. In Georgia, voting machines broke down, poll workers received inadequate training, and voters stood in line for up to seven hours in the heat and humidity because they never got their absentee ballots. And as we mentioned, this is not a new thing. These are things that have been happening for, for some time, and so there is still change that needs to be done. This is modern day voter discrimination, plain and simple. Voters in all these states risk their health and that of their communities to make their votes heard. People should be able to exercise their constitutional right to vote and stay healthy even during a pandemic. We should not have to choose between public health and a functioning democracy. State officials still have time, and that is where you all come in. Our ABLE campaign and advocates across the states are calling officials to immediately take steps to respond to current moments where the pandemic is threatening access to the ballot. And we're already seeing signs of progress in a lot of different states. And I just want to highlight a few of that um, progress that's taking place in the state. In Pennsylvania, which previously voted only 4% by mail, processed a record of 2 million ballot applications for the primary. Key cities in Mich Michigan are setting up drop boxes so that voters can surely and securely return their ballots and feel confident they'll count. In Georgia, we helped to kill a bill that would have prohibited sending a ballot application to every registered voter, one of the most common sense steps officials can be taking right now. And then in Wisconsin's elections, Commission re recently announced a plan to send a ballot application to every registered voter. And Milwaukee decided to offer 16 early voting locations, up from just three in 2016 presidential election. The work doesn't stop here. We can't see another Wisconsin, another Georgia in November, and with your help, we won't have to. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Lee Chapman, to ground us in the history of the struggle for voting rights. Thank you so much, Navesha. My name is Lee Chapman, and I'm the director of the Voting Rights Program at the Leadership Conference. I come to this work because my grandmother, who grew up in rural North Florida during segregation, told me how difficult it was to vote for our family. She never missed an election and emphasized the importance of voting and participating in our election. 
And I started my journey on advancing voting rights by registering voters at a local mall when I was in middle school. Voting is power. And we have a long way to go until we reach full participation in the voting process. And it's critical that we understand our history and how voter suppression is tied to systemic racism and white supremacy. Starting at the founding of our country when only white male landowners could cast their ballot and they made up 5% of the population. Saw the franchise expand with African American men with the 15th amendment and during reconstruction 16 African Americans were elected to Congress. But then there was an immediate contraction on the right to vote with states implementing restrictions like poll taxes, all white primaries, grandfather clauses, literacy tests, felony disenfranchisement laws, and voter intimidation at the polling place, which prohibited black voters, particularly those in the South, from casting a ballot. In order for black voters to register to vote, they were faced with impossible restrictions, like counting how many jelly beans are in a jar or how many bubbles were in a bar of soap, citing the entire preamble of the United States Constitution. We saw an expansion when women were given the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. Um, and the suffrage story is long and complicated. The organized movement started off closely aligned with the abolitionist movement and lasted from 1848 with the first Women's Rights Convention in New York to 1920 when the amendment was ratified by 38 states. In other words, it almost took 70 years and three generations of women and advocates before it was law. And as you heard in the opening, this year marks 100 years since the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Many Americans believe they know the full story of American suffrage for women. However, there's an untold history of women's suffrage and the women of color suffragists who fought for the right to vote. While we often hear the names of suffragettes like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and see pictures of white women holding up votes for women signs wearing their white dresses, there were many women of color who were critical in the movement, including Sojourner Truth, Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, Nina Otero Warren, and Louise McDonald Hearn of the Mohawk Nation and many others. Black women weren't treated equally during the suffrage movement and during the 1913 march, black women were told to march in the back and weren't able to march next to white women. So the movement continued after 1920 for all the women who did not get the right to vote then. Shortly after the 19th amendment was passed, many states passed laws prohibiting Mexican, Chinese, and Native American women from voting. And it would be decades until most black American women were able to achieve the right to vote with the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that finally eliminated many of those obstacles that I just mentioned. We saw a further expansion of the right to vote when African American were given the, the, the right to vote in 1965. And the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was signed after years of struggle in the civil rights movement. And lastly, we saw further expansion with the 26th Amendment um, which was passed in 1971, lowering the voting age to 18. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the Voting Rights Act. Um, it was passed in 1965 to ensure that state and local governments do not deny American citizens the equal right to vote based on their race, color, or membership in a minority language group. It banned literacy tests and similar devices, like what I mentioned previously, that were used to disenfranchise voters of color. And this momentous piece of legislation enshrines the right of every citizen and equal opportunity to participate in our democracy. The Voting Rights Act is really the most effective piece of civil rights legislation that's ever passed, been passed in our country. Even though we've made progress after the Voting Rights Act, the right to vote remains under threat currently. Right now we're seeing assaults on all fronts. The courts are rolling back voting rights protections and green lighting voter purges in states like Ohio and Georgia. Um, in the White House with the executive branch, we've seen a lack of voting enforcement by the Department of Justice and a continued false narrative from the White House um, with tweets promoting rigged elections and vote by mail fraud, really designed to deter and intimidate people from participating in our elections. And with the legislative branch and state legislatures, we've seen a flood of restrictive voting policies like strict voter ID laws, restrictions on voter registration, and cuts to early voting. 
federal level, we've seen key voting access bills like HR1 for the People Act and HR4, the Voting Rights Advancement Act, blocked by the Senate because of partisanship. So how do we get to where we are today? A key piece of that is the Shelby County versus Holder decision in 2013. In 2013, five justices of the Supreme Court gutted Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, the powerful preclearance provision which required states and election jurisdictions with a history of voting discrimination to obtain approval by the Department of Justice or a federal court before implementing new laws or policies. Since 2013, we have seen the floodgates of voter suppression open and have seen a wave of restrictive voter ID laws, polling place closures, voter purges, and restrictions on voter registration. Just over the last decade, we've seen over 200 restrictive voting bills introduced in 40 states. And we've seen the largest rollback of voting rights in over a century, and 25 new um, restrictive voting laws on the books. And all of these laws disproportionately impact voters of color. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our major federal priorities at the Leadership Conference in the voting rights space. Um, while elections are administered on the state and local level, there's a lot that Congress can actually do. So this year, in addition to all of the voting suppression issues that we are already facing, election administrators have been struggling with the challenges posed by COVID-19. And many of you have seen the images from Wisconsin and Kentucky and other places around the country during their primaries with long lines and massive polling place closures. And at the leadership conference, we really believe that voters should not have to choose between their health and participating in democracy. And so right now, you know, states need an immediate infusion of funds to have safe and accessible elections this year. And in May, the House passed the HEROES Act, which among many other things included $3.6 billion for safe and accessible elections, and had $25 billion for the United States Postal Service, and it would expand voter registration, same-day registration, vote by mail, and have at least two weeks of early voting, including that critical weekend before Election Day, and safe in-person voting on Election Day. And the bill passed the House of Representatives in May, uh, but unfortunately, it has not moved in the Senate. Another priority that the Leadership Conference is focused on is restoring the Voting Rights Act. Um, and that bill is now called the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Um, the bill passed the House last year, but unfortunately it has not moved in the Senate. Um, and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act would re reinstate a preclearance system that was gutted by the Supreme Court in the Shelby County versus Holder case I mentioned, and it would prevent states from enacting discriminatory voting barriers. So if we had the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act in place, we can prevent voter registration purges that affect hundreds of thousands, if not millions of voters, all because they may have missed an election or two. We can prevent implementation of photo ID laws that we know disproportionately prevent voters of color and younger voters from casting ballots. We can prevent jurisdictions from reducing the level of language assistance provided to citizens at the polls. We can prevent gerrymandering that dilutes black and brown votes. We can prevent the elimination of polling places, particularly in communities of color, and we can prevent any additional requirements and documentation like citizenship paperwork that many people just don't have access to. So now I'm going to kick it over to my colleague, Lindsay Walker, who's going to talk about barriers to the ballot in 2020. Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, once again, my name is Lindsay Walker. I'm a field associate here with the Leadership Conference. A little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in the D.C. area, but when I was in the 10th grade, I moved to Fredericksburg, Virginia. Now, Fredericksburg is only an hour south of D.C., so a lot of you guys that are familiar with the area and saying, oh, that's still the D.C. area, but no, it's, it's definitely not. Um, Fredericksburg has a lot of Civil War history, and I remember vividly when I moved there, it was the first time I saw the Confederate flag on a daily basis. They were on t-shirts, they were on backpacks, they were flown in front yards. And it was clear as day that many people in my community didn't share the same version of history 
and didn't share the same values. But it wasn't all bad. When I was in the, a senior, um, a senior in high school, I had a great AP government teacher named Ms. Maston. She had a really strong passion for the subject, and it kind of shined through um, to her students. It, there also was a re-election campaign going on, um, and I was only 17. And although I couldn't vote, I realized that I had the potential to make an impact in my community by volunteering and registering voters, and that's kind of where my love for this topic grew. But it's enough about me. Let's get into the barriers to the ballot. Um, so, um, I'm just going to go over a few of these just because there's so many, um, but there's a long list of barriers to the ballot on the screen. Uh, one of them is moving or consolidation closure of polling places. Last year, the leadership conference issued a report and that report basically said that there were over 1600 polling places, posing polling place closures in former section five states. Um, another one of these barriers is voter ID. So this is something that impacts folks in several different states. If you're a college student, it can even be more complicated. Uh, let's say you go to college in Ohio, but you're um, in Virginia. If you're registered in Ohio, you may have a Virginia driver's license, which doesn't prove that you're supposed to vote there. So there's special hoops that you may have to jump through if, if you're a college student as well. Uh, criminal disenfranchisement and language access are all different things that you know, we are working um, to address. Um, so moving forward, uh, during COVID, voters will be less likely to register in person. And this is a change that's impacting millions of people who register and update the registration in a presidential election year. States need to identify alternative ways for voters to access registration including making sure their online voter registration systems are ready for a surge in traffic capacity. Uh, so specific barriers for voting during COVID include misinformation about voting and misinformation about its impact, intimidation at the polls, uh, the need for accurate voting information in multiple languages, it's even more necessary. The protest context, with protests happening in many areas, there is a greater presence of law enforcement or even uniform military making it intimidating climate. Um, so this is something we've seen very often during the primaries earlier this year. So what can we do? There's so many different things we can do. Advocate, secondly, educate and communicate, and last but not least, protect the vote. Some of these things you know, and I'm sure that some of these things you all have helped lead on, but it's always good to name them so we're all on the same page. So advocacy. Uh, we are gonna go over so many different things. The first one is voter registration. Uh, this is so important um, and deadlines are even more important. Most of the time in most states, they are about a month before uh, election day. So that's in early October. Secondly, we have voter education. You guys are already familiar with that. This is a huge piece of that. Um, thirdly, is communication. We wanna make sure that the way we're talking about voting and voter, voter suppression is really, really important and has to be strategic to make sure that we're having that impact on our audience. Uh, next, outreach, outreach to election officials, legislative advocacy, election protection and movement building and ballot initiatives. So first, I know you guys are at a computer, but you may have access to your phone if you don't wanna exit this Zoom. So you can go to instillivote.org. Um, this is our website where you'll be able to take action on important issues and hear updates as we go. So voter registration. First, we have know your voter registration deadline. Um, so in-person voter registration activities have uh, really been affected and, by all the unfolding events. So we encourage you guys to encourage online virtual voter registration campaigns utilizing the 50-state tool available on vote401.org provided by the League of Women Voters, uh, which is also being updated daily as election processes and dates change. 
Um, so knowing your deadline, once again, is so, so important. Some states allow same day voter registration. Some states allow online voter registration. Um, but either way, it's, it's really important that you understand what law is in place in your state or what laws are in place in the communities that you're serving that, and that you're advocating for. Um, next, we have educating your friends and family um, on voter registration and connecting with voter advocacy groups for assistance with advocacy. Uh, voter education. So this is, there's so many different ways you can go about this. One of the, one of the ways is just incorporating voter education to every activity, outreach, and DOTV activity. So can you add key dates to a neighborhood bulletin? You can do, you can have a quick message in your house of worship or a sermon. Um, those are some key ways. Another thing that we have to be mindful of is knowing where your polling place is. So this is something that is extremely important because as we mentioned before, they can often change. Um, another thing to keep in mind is even if you're in the same city, if you move to another neighborhood, your polling location can, can change as well. Uh, next, we have engaging movement groups on the ground and incorporating voter education into their advocacy. So story collection. Now, this is something that a lot of organizations are doing, and you guys are probably already familiar with, but one of the most important aspects of story collection is making sure that you are respecting the person's story. So for instance, if a person is giving their story in Spanish or Spanglish, um, you want to make sure that you're keeping that in its original voice and its original tone so that you kind of respect the essence of that story. You don't want to dilute it or you don't want to change it to kind of cater to a particular audience. So you want to make sure you're uplifting people's stories and experiences voting. Um, there are so many different ways you can do this through social media. Uh, and we really continue to, we really encourage you guys to continue to share your stories and to make sure if you're sharing other people's stories, you have their permission and you also use the same essence and the same details in their story when promoting them. Um, so that is uh, pretty much it. So right now I'm actually going to turn it over to my colleague Jordan and she's going to get into some more details on messaging. Uh, thanks, Lindsay. So messaging around the problems and the barriers to the ballot are really important. And our primary goal is to shine a spotlight and activate our audiences to fight against discriminatory barriers to the ballot in their local communities in a way that resonates, right? Like a way that they feel invested in making this happen. So messaging around voter suppression, um, we say voter suppression because this is sort of like within the family, inside baseball, I guess you would say, but really we, what we need to be saying is barriers to the ballot, discriminatory barriers, needless barriers, and then give a real life example of what that looks like, whether that's the need, that, that's the college student that Lindsay mentioned that lives in one state but is registered in another and doesn't have the ID that matches, or it's um, an older voter who just can't get to the polls. Whatever that story is, we want them to feel that, that they understand the problem and it frames the story in a way that actually resonates. Elected officials, I mean, they're critical in this. One thing that we need folks to be doing, I mean, they're not meeting with us in person, but you can still make phone calls, you can still write emails, you can still um, join online town halls um, with these folks because we need them to understand and advocate for policies that are gonna protect the vote. So contact them directly and ask whether they're taking the 10 steps that we have provided in the toolkit. Again, something that you'll get as a resource after this training, but we need folks to be protecting the ballot and we need elected officials, particularly on the local level, to really make this happen. So many of you might have heard about the recent cuts to the United States Postal Service. I know um, I've heard it, uh, not just because I work on, on this every day, but I've heard it like on NPR stories. I just saw something in the New York Times. I mean, 
this is something that people are paying attention to. Because when Postmaster General Louis DeJoy took office on June 15th of this year, he swiftly took multiple actions that created a mail slowdown across the country. He made cuts and he, um, he enlist, er, and, um, enacted different policies that, that delayed the process of the mail at a time when an effective postal service is needed more than ever to provide essential services and handle vote by mail. I mean, we're not just talking about voting by mail. We're talking about people not getting their medication or their social security check, things that really impact people's everyday lived experience. These actions that the, the that Postmaster General DeJoy took included ordering employees to leave mail and packages behind rather than work overtime or make multiple trips to complete their routes, as many of them had been doing to address a pandemic related staffing shortage and increased package demand. I don't know about you, but I am using mail now more than ever. So what we're doing is we're working with a coalition of hundreds of groups around the country demanding the following of Congress. They need to provide $25 billion in direct emergency funding and relief for the United States Postal Service. We need to require that all election of official election mail be treated as first class mail. And we need to prohibit the removal of mail sorting machines and mailboxes and reversing any already implemented changes that could further delay mail delivery. So we must keep the pressure on elected officials to be sure that we um, that every eligible voter can vote safely and securely, whether in person or by mail. The United States Postal Service is the only entity that can handle vote by mail and postal workers have been handling these ballots effectively for many years. That's how the military votes and when they are deployed. USPS handles 3 billion pieces of mail in the week before Christmas. So managing vote by mail won't be a problem as long as the current administration lets postal workers do their job. So we um, are continuing this advocacy and this fight um, and uh, the uh, solution to all of these problems. Next, election protection. One way um, to be involved in the election is by being an election protection volunteer. Nonpartisan election protection volunteers are voters' first line of defense against restrictive election laws, coronavirus related voting disruptions, or anything else that could silence their voices. They do this by monitoring polling places from their vehicle or with proper personal safety equipment watching social media for disinformation, or reaching out to voters to make sure that they know their rights. They can connect voters with trained legal professionals who can help them navigate the voting process in real time and cast their ballots safely and securely. The 1-866-R-VOTE number is available in multiple languages and is a great resource for anybody who um, has election related concerns. So what are five things that you can do that any one of us could do right now to make voting more accessible this year. So sharing reliable and accurate information about voting. Tell folks to go to instillivote.org um, for information about voting rights um, or their voting status. Talk to your elected officials uh, to ensure that access to the ballot during the pandemic, um, that we, know, we need to know that we have a safe, fair, and healthy election process. Tell five friends to make a plan to vote, in person or by mail, before election day and safely. Um, we're advocating that people get their absentee ballot well in advance and so they're able to return it in a timely manner. And that's something that you can make a plan with your friends and family around. Tell your voting story. I mean, even if you haven't had your vote um, uh, um, suppressed in some way, if you talk about why you're doing this work and why, why it's important to you, use social media as that vehicle. And become an election protection volunteer or poll worker. Be a poll worker. I was a poll worker. It's a great time. It really is, honestly. It's a long day, but it's a great time. Um, why? Because poll workers are the backbone of our elections. There's a chronic shortage of election workers nationwide that's going to threaten our democratic process. This threat is even more critical among COVID-19, and we can't wait. Those folks that we have typically depended on, older folks that um, are reliably poll workers, they are just not going to be able to do this. Um, this year without risking their own health. So even in a normal election year, more than half of cities and counties struggle to recruit enough workers needed to run free and fair elections. This causes those long lines that we've seen, you know, that were people were waiting in thunderstorms and heat in Georgia um, during the primary for five hours. 
And waits tend to be longest at polling places that serve communities of color, where voters have historically faced barriers to the ballot. Poll workers have vital responsibilities. They set up voting machines, they hand out ballots, they assist voters with disabilities or language access issues, they check in voters and they review their IDs where they are required. And guess what? They can even get paid. Um, so we are working with many groups that are, are doing poll worker recruitment. When polling places aren't prepared, our voices aren't heard. So together with Power uh, the Polls, the Leadership Conference and All Voting is Local is working to recruit poll workers to safeguard our electoral process and ensure that every voter in every community has a voice. Now more than ever, we can't allow our voices to be silenced. We have the power to be heard and to protect our democracy. So what can you do between now and election day? Sign up, go to power the polls slash ACS. That way they know that you're coming from the American Constitution Society, or you can certainly do it through our um, channels, which is power the polls ABL partnership or power the polls leadership comp partnership. But most importantly, follow up. If you haven't heard from city or county officials within two weeks of signing up, give them a call and make sure that you know when your training is and when you can expect to see your polling place assignment. Um, this is gonna be a year where, uh, you know, we're gonna need more poll workers, but we're trying to figure out a way to add capacity so that they're actually getting placed. So what are some of the tactics that we use um, as an organization and that folks can do on their own even? Patch through calls are a great way and um, they're fast and cost effective way to connect supporters to key decision makers by getting volunteers to call voters, identify if they are supportive, educate them on the issue, and then connect them directly with their representative. This is a great way for us to get many, many calls into um, elected officials' office. Twitter storms, that's a popular tactic that we use with many of our coalition partners to draw attention to the voting rights issue. Um, by creating tweets that include specific hashtags. As I mentioned, this is something that we, as I mentioned about the toolkit, this is something um, that we've included, which is social media guidance, so that you have information on hashtags that um, can be trending or that you as the ACS um, volunteer group can use together. Letter to the editors campaign, getting folks to write letters um, into local newspapers, that still works. People still do it and people still read them and virtual house parties. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I know I've signed up for several virtual house parties um, over the last few months to support either an elected official or a candidate or a cause. Um, and that's something that you can do using Facebook um, or as we all do many times a day, Zoom. So here's an overview of voting websites and election protection resources. Um, there are many groups doing really, really wonderful work around this, and they are our partners in this fight. Um, these are some of the, the, the websites or the numbers that you can use, and this, again, is included in your um, election protection toolkit. And now, before we close out, we're going to show one more video, and we hope you enjoy it. Elias? They tried to silence me. They tried to block me. They tried to deny me. To scare me. To scare me. They tried to erase me. To erase me. Erase me. They tried to keep me down. Keep me down. Keep me down. They tried to make me invisible. Invisible. They tried to pretend I don't matter. Pretend my people don't matter. But my people I don't matter. They tried to kill me. They tried to kill me. Kill me. They tried to they tried. They try to block. They try to block. They try to deny me. And still. And still. And still. And still, I vote. I vote. Todavía voy a votar. And still, I vote. I vote. Still, I vote. And still, I vote. Thank you all so much for joining us today for this training. We hope we've done a good job in outlining why this moment is so important with the intersection of voter suppression, racial injustice, and a systemic oppression during a global pandemic. Your work to ensure safe, accessible, and fair elections in 2020 is critical, and we want to support you all in this work. So thank you so much, and I'm going to turn it back to Lindsay for questions and answers. 
Thank you, Jordan. And just a reminder, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box um, within Zoom and we will get to as many as we can. Um, the first question is, what should I do if my state's actually doing a pretty good job, um, but I am interested in the efforts going on in another state, perhaps one that's just getting more attention like Wisconsin? Sure, I can take that. Um, you know, you can always sign up to be an election protection volunteer. And Jordan mentioned Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law is our partner for election protection. Um, so I would go on that website and you can sign up to be a nonpartisan poll observer. Now, each state has different laws as far as who is allowed inside the polling place. You might have to be outside. You could be in a call center. You know, there's various different ways that you can volunteer. Um, but I would recommend um, voter protection and election protection through Lawyers Committee. Excellent. Um, the next question, sorry, just getting myself organized for a second. Um, the next question we've got is, is there any data on what is the most effective tactic to take? And when you're we're thinking about, oh, there's a problem going on in my area, um, is there one particular tactic or is it just kind of whatever is within your bandwidth? Jordan, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. As I mentioned, so we're a national organization, but we have very, we have tons of state partners and there are groups in your state that you can connect with that are doing this kind of advocacy work on the ground and can help give you some direction. I mean, one thing that we're asking folks to do in most states um, to, is to make um, early voting even earlier, to get um, ballots, absentee ballots sent to all citizens or registered voters, I mean, um, and, you know, calling their secretary of state to see what protections have been put in place. Um, I would connect with somebody locally. And as I mentioned, we are going to be putting together or in the, in the toolkit is a list of um, groups and organizations doing this work where you can get connected um, and, and make a difference in your backyard. Or to Lee's point, you can make a difference in, in another state that probably needs more help. Um, there are some states that are doing okay. So, um, but whatever way you can get involved uh, with election protection is critical. Excellent, and I think along the same theme, um, but maybe a little bit different. Uh, we have a question, if I'm an attorney, what are the best avenues to use my legal background and knowledge to help protect those who are facing barriers to the vote? Someone's already getting the language right. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I would just say election protection as well, uh, lawyers committee. Um, I've been a nonpartisan election protection volunteer many times. I'm an attorney as well. So one thing that they do, will they'll give you a training, they'll give you a handbook on that specific state's election law. And, um, you know, you're really there to just help voters in real time as they face issues or problems. So I would think that's probably the best use of your time. There's also um, another group called um, We the Action and Mark Elias, he runs that and that's another way for a lot of lawyers to volunteer and take on discrete like research projects in, in states. So um, I would also take a look at that organization as well. Excellent. Um, and the training was so thorough that we don't have that many questions. So we've run out of our list. Um, but I do want to remind everybody that there's gonna be a follow-up email with specific elec election protection links. Um, so you don't have to go digging for things. We'll, we'll try and keep them all in the follow-up email for you. Definitely sign up um, and um, let us know if we can be helpful in connecting you to different organizations. But I just wanna say thank you so much to the Leadership Conference. This is such a great panel. Um, and we really appreciate all of the information you, you provided for us today. Thanks so much, Lindsay. And thanks to all of you for being part of the training today. We hope uh, it was helpful and please take it out into the world. Thank you. Thank you, have a good night. Thank you so much.